Good evening and welcome to tonight's Driver's Ed class. We are in our third week, special week at the halfway point, and it's the beginning of Christmas vacation. So we'll wait for people to jump on in, make sure that you sign in on your phone, make sure that you put your name over in the comment section so I can see who's here. Uh, did things a little bit different um, with drive times. I put the drive times up here uh, for the next two days. I've got a couple openings tomorrow for anybody who would uh, like to drive. Um, if we get multiple people texting in uh, what they would like to do for uh, for drive times, um, then I'll have to choose at the end of the evening. Uh, preferably, I would like people that uh, haven't been signing up uh, to get first priority to drive times. Um, but we do have the week of vacation to really get a lot done so um, I do want people to clear up some space I don't expect you to spend your whole vacation just worrying about driver's ed but I do believe it's important that since you aren't in school uh, you don't have online to do or the coursework um, is going to be that heavy probably during Christmas break with your other classes let's put some time and effort into uh, driver's ed stuff so those are the times that I have tomorrow at 3 and 4. Wednesday, I have 8, 9, 10, and 11 in the morning. And I don't want Wednesday to be sporadic, meaning drive at 8, off at 9, drive at 10, off at 11. So we're going to try to build out the day if we can. So that is how we're going to handle that. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to be able to look through the messages probably until... Um, after class so I'll take a look at that I'll put this back up on the board um, just as we're done class uh, just to remind people if you haven't signed up to uh, do it and we'll go from there so let's kind of bring down let's see how many people we only have eight only eight come on where is everybody let me just look at my phone here let's see if I can count here one two three four five six seven yeah eight people I guess slowly we're getting up to 11. It's really tough, I know. 7.30, um, got to finish up with other school activities. Maybe you're a, a late dinner person, so wrapping that up. But we've got just about um, three-fourths of a class, so we're only missing a few people. Um, I'm almost suspecting that people didn't look at their sheet and understand or did not pay attention last week and understand that we have class. We have class this Monday and next Monday um, because we are not going to have class on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve because uh, then I know for sure I'm not going to have the number of people that I should have. Okay, we weren't able to complete the section on sign signals and pavement markings. Um, so we're going to finish that up to start with, and then we're going to get into stopping and road rage. I'm going to save speed uh, for tomorrow. Uh, so we'll probably do some things with speed uh, tomorrow. So let's kind of get out and get right into what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, we ended last Thursday talking about traffic lights and a green light of course is an indicator that we can go through the intersection the thing you need to remember with a green light is that it doesn't always give you uh, protection meaning there are going to be cars that are running red lights so if you're the first one going through on a green light I would hesitate for a moment before I cross without uh, making checks I'd, I'd check and then I would start through on a green light. But also if you're about three or four cars back and there will be people that will turn right on red without stopping. 
that was a case in point today. We were driving in Dover, coming back to Durham, and we had someone blow right through a stop sign. Now, we were somewhat uh, beyond a green light, but it very well could have been at an intersection. And this case was just a side street, a secondary street that came onto the primary road that we were driving on. The thing that you have to always think about with any type of intersection is that the cars that are coming from either side will not do what they're supposed to do. It would be nice if everybody followed traffic law and they were courteous and kind when they drove. But I think you know now, people don't do that. So now it's left up to us, as we learned earlier the first week about being um, dangerous or vulnerable, is that we've got to assume the worst when we drive. And by far, the hardest light to handle is the yellow light. Green is a little bit challenging. Red is pretty, red is the easiest. Okay, when it's red, we stay stopped. We don't do anything. We wait for the light to turn green. Um, but it's the yellow light that is getting us to that red light that is the most dangerous. So what I'd like you to do to write down in your notes, approach your traffic light, your green light, assuming that it's going to change to yellow before you get there. We saw the video last week how traffic lights are activated by um, clusters of cars going through. There's a magnetic uh, field underneath the pavement that senses when we're getting closer. It can sense cars coming from left and right. Uh, so that's how it's going to get activated for a change. The biggest problem I find with students and drivers in general is that they're going at or above the speed limit approaching a green light. Now, we will spend some time, probably tonight, talking about stopping distance. I would say there's not a single one of you that has a clue on what it takes to stop a car within a certain amount of feet. You probably never really thought, well, okay, I'm going 30 miles per hour. What does a stopping distance look like? You know, you know and we're going to talk about what do you actually think at 30 miles per hour? What is your stopping distance going to be? I'm going to give you something other than 30. Um, but you're going to be surprised. You're going to be surprised what stopping distance is. So my word of wisdom to you is approach every traffic light like it's going to be changing. So this is what I want you to write down in your notes. Approach every green light two to three miles below the posted speed limit. That is going to give you at least an extra second or two seconds maybe of stopping distance or processing what to do with the yellow light. So with some yellow lights, you're going to choose to go through. The other uh, yellow lights you're going to stop for. Um, there is a term that I use. It's called the point of no return. So as you approach that traffic light, um, understand that it is going to take some time to stop. So know your speed, have a good concept of what that stopping distance looks like. So we're going to kind of study that tonight. Also, second point here, know what is behind you. Okay, what's behind you? So when you do make a decision to stop, you better know that the person behind you is going to be able to stop too. Because if they don't, all right, they're going to run right into you and then they're going to push you right into the flow of traffic. So the recommendation here is to find an object off to the side of the road and count, all right? Um, basically say, if I get to that um, crack in the road, if I get to that sign, that's going to probably give me a couple seconds. Um, that's going to be my distance that I need. And you've already made up your mind. So it's already predetermined. And that's what it is. Let me show you. I, I took a video. I think this was my phone or maybe I had my GoPro at the time. Let me take a uh, let me show you what a yellow light as it changes. So here we are in Durham, uh, stopped in traffic. I believe this is a GoPro. It really looks like the light is further away than it actually is. And as we approach the traffic light, 
you're going to see the light turn yellow. Now, the way you're supposed to treat a yellow light, it should be yellow the, the whole time that you're going through the intersection. See, it's green, it's green, it's green, it's yellow. Look, we never saw it turn red. That is a correct procedure um, through a, a traffic light. If you're looking up, if you're looking up and you can see that where we saw a yellow light, if that's now turning red, you're thinking, oh, I'm in the intersection. I'm just clearing through. No, that's supposed to be where the light is yellow like we just saw. So if you're looking at the traffic light and it's red, you're on this side of the intersection, you are now running a red light. That's not you, what you want to do. So I want you to write down the point of no return. Practice it while you're with your parents. Practice it while you're with uh, your friends that drive. Uh, it is something that you basically want to train your mind on how to handle uh, the traffic light. Because once your mind is telling you yes or no, it's easy to make the car stop. Um, I don't know if this is the next bullet or not. Um, let's get through this first and then I'll show you red light runners. Okay, let's talk about arrows a little bit. Green arrows are called protected turns. So anytime you've got a green arrow, consider um, the, the easiest, best way to turn at an intersection, whether it be right or left. Traffic is not supposed to be going where you're turning into with a protected turn. So protected turn is what you want. Now, a red arrow to the right you got to stop. Now, in most cases, you can still turn right on a red arrow unless posted. So here I found an intersection in Dover that actually uh, has the sign indicating we can't turn right on that red arrow. And the interesting part is that there are so many complaints that uh, the city of Dover has now taken down that sign and they have now made it legal. So that's the thing you need to understand is that signs can come up to make things illegal and then they can take them down. And then it becomes legal, and it could be all in a, a matter of uh, days. So things constantly change. Take nothing for granted. Always be looking for your signs. Now, a left arrow. I want you to write this down because we do have a couple of these in Dover. A solid arrow, whether it be right or left, in this case it's left, you need to stop. And you have to wait for the light to change to green. Now, let me clarify this because it gets a little complicated if the light is blinking whether it be to the right or to the left or if it's a solid circle red light treat it like a stop sign write that down in your notes you're going to need to know that for your midterm a blinking red light is basically a stop sign well why don't they put up a stop sign well which do you think you would see sooner in the driving environment if you're going down a road, do you think you're going to see a light that is up much higher than a stop sign or the stop sign? By, by far, you're going to see the light from a greater distance. Well, how about another situation? wonder if the light, or at night, you go, what are you going to see first, the traffic light or the stop sign? You're going to see the traffic light. Now, in some cases, they're going to also include a stop sign to help you. So you've got, you know, a double indicator oh here we go always look for traffic around you now this is just a picture but i want to tell you just to the right of that van this video i i couldn't find it so it's just a uh, a thumbnail of what the beginning of the video looks like so i can't make this go but just to the right of that van will be a car that is zipping through the intersection and they're going at a pretty good rate and the thing is is that the car that's running the red light actually goes between two moving cars i mean it's incredible that there wasn't a serious crash where someone got t-boned but i do have a few video clips and this is in missouri of people running red lights so i want to show you this now what i want you to find from this video is how long is the light red? Now, I know there's going to be situations where you have slowed down for the yellow light. Um, you say you're going to go through and then all of a sudden you look up and it looks like it's just turning red. So there's like a second that you saw the light. 
as we learned in the video, lights don't change right off. There is going to be a little bit of a buffer from the left and the right when you're running a red light. It's not going to go straight red light to green light. Um, it, there's going to be a little bit of a buffer with your yellow light. But let's take a look at these people that are running red lights. You're going to be surprised. And let's count. So let's count some of the seconds of people going through these traffic lights. So we're going to take a look at the light. Okay, one, two, three, about two and a half. And by the way, there's a display stop line. Look how the left stop line is different than the two stop lines for the people to the right. Okay, the light turns red. One two, three, four. That's like four and a half seconds. The car to the right had already started to go out. And that's the problem I was talking about. If it's green, you've got to wait a moment. You've got to pick up that car. You should be looking. Okay. One, two, three, same situation. Car to the right is already starting off the stop line. One, two, three. Here's the car. He splits two cars. Now this person passes somebody. The U-Haul truck passes to get through that intersection. This is one of my favorites. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then they realize, uh-oh, these trucks are bigger than me. They're going to win. It's going to be bad. I better not do it. And he bails out. Most of the people, I think, are not paying attention. Here's another one. Now we're getting to see cars get hit. So there's a little bit of contact in that. And notice the more lanes you have, you get hidden. Your car is hidden if you're running the red light. So if there's cars off to the right and you're passing on the left, like here's another situation. The bus actually creates some type of a, of a shield. So that's why the person to the right came out from the green light and never had a chance. Thought he had a, a safe passage to go through the intersection. Now, I think number two is worse than number one. You tell me afterwards, do you think this is worse than number one? So... Yes, that is a pedestrian. See, a school bus is bad, but I don't think it's as bad as a pedestrian. Now, this is an extra one, and this by far is probably the worst. Um, it's incredible how far back the person's running this light. So watch, the light's going to turn red. Okay, now it's turning red. So you're going to see a person come to a stop in the right lane. Okay, did the right thing. Look at that other car. Almost hit the bus. Now they're going to show you from... Um, the opposite direction. So you're going to see how far back. Now look at the two cars. The one that stop is going to be over in the left lane. The one that's going to be buzzing by is in the right lane. Look at the car stopping. And that car definitely had enough distance and time, but, but didn't stop. That's the problem that we're having. That's why you don't want to run red lights. Now, write this down. A lot of metropolitan areas are using what we call uh, photo enforcement. Write down photo enforcement. Photo enforcement is where there's not enough patrol officers to uh, look at some of these bad intersections. So what they're doing is they're setting up cameras. So your ticket is going to be sent to you in the mail. So you're never going to get pulled over by a police officer. You're just going to get 
something in the mail that indicates, okay, it's time to go to the courthouse because they've got me go for going through the traffic light. And you're going to have to go and, and, and fight it if you think it's not you. Uh, crosswalks, what I want you to write down about crosswalks, and I wish I had some of these movies. Um, I just couldn't um, download them and get them uh, loaded up. But crosswalks, you should stay back about 10 to 15 feet. And make sure that you don't, when you're in heavy traffic, uh, downtown Dover, because Durham's not going to have any traffic now, but you don't stop on a crosswalk in traffic. So it's bumper to bumper. You're rolling up to the car in front of you. They're just in front of the stop uh, crosswalk. Don't stop on the crosswalk. Stay back that 10, 15 feet to give uh, pedestrians a chance to cross and to be seen. Now, most cities now are using flashing lights or the neon yellow pedestrian signs to indicate there's a crosswalk. So if there are double lanes and one lane is backed up, and you see a little bit of an opening, that is where a pedestrian is going to walk through. If you've got clear passage in the left lane, go slow as you approach every crosswalk because you just don't know when it's going to be a pedestrian that's walking in between um, the stop vehicles. In some metropolitan areas, they're using bike lights with bike lanes. So they give the symbol of a bike and make it the same color as a green traffic light for a car. But they're using the symbol of a bike, which is kind of cool. Um, so if you ever drive in another state, um, a big city, don't be surprised if you see that. So that is not your light. That is the bicyclist light. Could it be different than your green light or red light? Absolutely. Um, so don't play off their light. You'll be looking for what's for you over your lane and by the way most traffic lights if there are multiple lanes should have a, a light for each designated lane so that way you're targeting your car down the road and as you approach that light you're keying in on um, even if there's nobody in front of you you're keying in on what is the light directly above my lane if you ever have an opportunity to drive in another country just knowing your shapes and your colors should do you well. Now, when I went to Italy last October, I didn't have to take a driving test. I did have to provide a copy of my driver's license, and I did have to pay a fee at AAA, and they gave me, and I probably should have, I could probably get it for tomorrow. I'll show it to you. I have it in one of my um, um, drawers here. Uh, and it looks kind of like a, a foreign license. So yeah, you can drive in another country. Now, make sure that you understand what side of the road to drive on. Understand they're going to use kilometers rather than miles per hour. And be very careful. It, they are very much in other countries using photo enforcement. My son-in-law did most of the driving when we were in Italy. And believe it or not, they actually sent him his speeding ticket back here in the United States, okay? And it, and they did it through the rental company. So you, you may think, okay, I'm just not going to pay and I'm never going back to Italy. Well, the rental company has your credit card information and that's part of um, when you uh, drive over there. Uh, they've got information about you. So they'll, they'll come after you uh, one way or another to get that money. And I can't remember how much he had to pay. I think it was well over $100, it could have been even a little bit more than that now that I think of it. I'll have to ask him this Christmas if he stops by. Um, but driving in another country is a lot of fun. I did some driving in Rome. Um, it's just like driving over here. It really is. You know, keep the following distance. Um, you know, just kind of watch for your signs. You should be able to know by the symbols. And um, it really wasn't complicated driving. So... Hopefully sometime in your life you'll be able to do that. Now, can you explain this sign? What, what makes this sign different? Now, some of you may have already figured this out, but if you look at the bottom left corner, that is the bottom of a side mirror. 
I was stopped in traffic and I was looking at that and I go, wow, I never really thought about that. Images are backwards. So when you look in your mirrors, anything that is being spelt is going to be backwards. If you take a look at the word ambulance, if you look at an ambulance, you're walking down the road and an ambulance is coming towards you, you'll notice that the word ambulance is spelled backwards. So when the ambulance is behind you and you look in your rear view mirror, it's going to spell it correctly. That way you're not guessing exactly what it is. Uh, one of the things that uh, is happening now, and I've had this old little clip for a long, long time, is uh, sign recognition. And even in the driver's ed car that we have right now, if I put um, a different screen on rather than your digital display, um, the GPS will actually give you a reading of what the speed limit was when they um, when they um, did the GPS unit. Let me show you what this looks like. While driving, one passes so many traffic signs that sometimes even important information, such as speed limits or no overtaking signs, can get lost. The driver can also sometimes be distracted by traffic and not notice some of the signs. The Ford Traffic Sign Recognition System eliminates this issue by showing important traffic sign information in the instrument panel cluster. On display are speed limits and bans on overtaking, as well as their cancellation. The front camera records the traffic signs and transmits the respective data to the vehicle's traffic sign recognition system. The traffic sign recognition system uses an aging algorithm. This means that recently detected signs appear lighter. After a while, the color gets darker until the signs begin to gray out and finally completely disappear. This helps to make the driver aware of changes in real time. So I thought that was pretty cool for you to understand that technology is out there that's going to really help us with driving. Because one of the biggest things is if you were, were getting bombarded with lots of input that all of a sudden it's like, oh, I missed that last sign. What is it? Well, this is going to really help us out a lot um, with signs that we may have missed, especially speed limit signs because we don't want to miss that or what route we're on or what street we're on. Um, pavement markings, there are four things I want you to uh, write down and know about pavement markings. Uh, most of you probably already know this, but we're going to kind of um, put some meaning behind it. We can go by the color and we can go by whether it's solid or broken. So let's deal with the obvious. A solid line to the left of your, of your car, okay, on the driver's side, a solid line indicates no passing. A broken uh, dotted line to the left of the vehicle indicates passings allowed. Now we've got to think about the color. Yellow is always telling us traffic is coming towards us, so two-way traffic. If we have a dotted white line that's to the left of us, that indicates that it is a one-way roadway. The line to the right of us, on the right side of a vehicle, is what we call the fog line. All right, so write that down. A lot of people just say the edge line, which isn't, you know, wrong, but, excuse me, um, the state has a tendency to always call it the fog line on a driver's test. So if you hear the driving inspector say, you're too close to the fog line, that's what they're referring to. So in heavy, uh, bad weather, like fog, you should be looking towards that fog line or driving towards you know, right of center, which would be near the fog line. The line to the left of you um, will indicate, as we just said, whether it be on coming traffic or one-way traffic. Now, there are some other markings on the road that we should be familiar with, and the one that I really want you to know is shared turn lanes, and we have those in Dover. That's that yellow line, solid line, with the dotted dash on the inside, 
you don't make a left hand turn in the left lane. You have to go to that middle lane, to that shared left turn lane. And I was talking to someone today. The common problem that a lot of people have with shared turn lanes is that they move over to it, but the back of their vehicle is sticking out. You have to be parallel to that line in order to make that left-hand turn. The other problem that a lot of people have with it, and I'm going to have to make a video of this because it really is such a difficult thing to do. And I don't have students use that shared turn lane that often. Um, but the problem is, is that if you're coming out from a, let's say a fast food restaurant and you have an opening uh, on, on the left side to get across through a couple lanes, but you don't have any openings in the flow of traffic that in the direction that you want to go, you should move your vehicle over into that left shared turn lane and wait with your right signal on till it's time to merge over. Um, so write this down in your notes. It's the, one of the most difficult things to do in driving in the city is to utilize the uh, shared turn lane and to utilize it correctly, especially coming out from a side road or from a fast food restaurant. If you do use it, make sure that you stay back about a 10 foot, 15 foot width of a vehicle because you could have someone coming right at you. You could move into that left turn lane to make a left turn and someone coming towards you could move into that shared turn lane to make a left-hand turn. So what are you going to do? You both want to make a left-hand turn. Well, only one of you can use a particular area. So stay back about 10, 15 feet and give a hand gesture to the person um, that you want them to use it first, or maybe they're going to give you the hand gesture and then you can use it first. But like I said, it can get pretty darn compl uh, complicated um, in, the, in the city when you try to utilize that. Um, the rest of it is pretty straightforward, multi-lanes, one-way streets, two-way roadways, rural um, crosswalk stop lines. We already know that kind of stuff, so I'm not going to spend any extra time on, on that. I do want to spend a little bit of time on this, and this is reversible lanes. You're going to see this in metropolitan areas. Now, in New Hampshire, I can't think of a place that we actually have this. All right. Now, what they're trying to do, and notice, it almost looks like a left shared turn lane in the middle. But what that does is that middle lane changes according to the time of day. So it's not a, a shared turn lane. It is a traveling lane, but it is changing according to the daytime. Now, if you did your reading in the textbook, you understand that a green arrow pointing down at your lane indicates a lane that you may travel in for any amount of distance. If you have a red X over your lane, you should not be traveling in that lane. If you have a flashing yellow arrow or X, you may use that lane for a short period of time, but then you've got to move to the right. All right. So the middle lane changes. So notice in the morning, it's going to the left, but at night it's going to the right. So if it was a city, they're trying to get a high volume of traffic into the city in the morning. They're trying to get a high volume of traffic out of the city. Now, the closest thing that we have is something called the zipper lane. So write down zipper lane. The zipper lane is the same thing as a reversible lane, but they take concrete jersey barriers and they block you from oncoming traffic. So it's almost um, a protected area. And, and a lot of times they're using that zipper lane as the carpool lane. So let me show you, um, I think I've got it. Yeah, let me see if it's the next slide and then I'll show you the video that I have. Yeah, here we go. So there's the zipper lane. Notice you've got cones and then all of a sudden you have a special lane where you've got these barriers on either side. So you're being protected. Now, the only problem about utilizing the zipper lane is that if you want to get off at an exit, you can't do it. So this zipper lane is taking you the whole length of this road. So don't go in in that area if you want to get, get off the highway in a relatively short distance. So let me show you. This is just south of Boston. So this is the closest one. So this is about a little over an hour away from where we are in Durham. Uh, my daughter lives um, 
um, south of Boston in Quincy, and we were going down to visit. My wife was driving, so I took out my cell phone, and I did this quick video. So notice the flashing light to give you a chance to get out if you wanted to. So now we're traveling in the zipper lane. See how well protected you are? You don't have to worry about any traffic. Now the other bad part is what happens if you have a flat tire? There's not much of a breakdown lane or a soft uh, a shoulder, so you are going to hold up traffic behind you. So any type of mechanical uh, breakdown uh, is a problem. Now notice way over to the right we have a green guide sign so if you want to take this exit too bad uh, not today you're in the zipper lane you should have stayed off to the right now as I said at night it's gonna go in the opposite direction okay that's gonna be for people you know going into Boston So that's a little bit of the zipper lane. Uh, HOV, the only thing I want you to know from this slide is HOV uh, stands for high occupancy vehicle. And the other thing I want you to write down is who can use the high occupancy vehicle. You have to have two people in the car. All right, so it's like a carpool lane. Now, the only time that you can be the only one in the car, so only the driver in the vehicle, and still use the HOV in some states. If you are in a hybrid, like the driver's ed car, they would allow you to utilize the HOV. But for most states, it's two people or more. Um, interstate and state routes, I do want you to um, know this. This is from the state manual. We talked about the highway transportation system, that the interstate system is built on a grid. Uh, it goes north, south, east, west. So what I want you to remember is that an odd number, like uh, what we have here, 17 is an odd number. Odd first number goes north, south. If it was 80, it was an even first number, it would go east, west. Now, when it refers to state routes, which we have by a shield like 202, um, the Old Man of the Mountain, which is Route 11, Route 16, uh, those are only two digits. That's very specific only to New Hampshire. But if we had a uh, three-digit route like what we have in Durham, which is 108, or we have 155, a three-digit state route with a odd number, like a one, would go through a city. If it's an even number, it goes through or around. It could do either or or both. Like 202 in Rochester does both. It goes around on the Spalding. You can use the Spalding as 202 to get you around downtown Rochester, or you could stay right on 202, and it'll take you right through the heart of Rochester and through the other side into um, Lebanon, Maine. So numbers are supposed to guide you in direction. Display stop lines. Notice the two arrows uh, the lanes are uh, back from where the right lane, <clears throat> excuse me, that is going straight or turning. Uh, the reason why they do that is to allow large trucks and buses to make turns. Now, we do have two display stop lines in Durham. One is over near the Irving gas station, and it's only about five feet but the one that's really like 15 feet from the right stop line is over near the field house, over near where the Wildcat Monument is, that intersection there. You'll notice that the stop line. And here, here's a picture of that intersection. And I thought this was kind of funny. I was driving with a student. I go, oh, I got to take a picture of this. It's a state trooper that does the wrong thing. I think I was talking to uh, uh, Haley today about... Um, officers not doing what they're supposed to notice the motorcycle he stopped at the stop line look where the state trooper is his whole vehicle is beyond the stop line and look what color the light is it's a red light okay he wasn't paying attention he was making a mistake so even the police at times aren't perfect so i thought that was kind of kind of funny 
Uh, school, ba- uh, school bus safety. Uh, we still do have young kids picking up buses and going to school. Uh, so a few things here I want you to write down. Uh, the first thing is that with a school bus, a yellow light will come on before they turn on the red lights. And by law, we have to stop 25 feet behind a bus with flashing red lights. So the minute you see a yellow light, you've got to start thinking, okay, where is he actually going to come to a stop? They put it on probably about 100, 200 feet before they're going to actually stop. So you've got plenty of time if you're paying attention. Now, most crashes are going to happen when people are coming towards the bus because their lane is still see is open when you're behind a bus you can't go anywhere the bus is in front of you so it makes sense okay i gotta stop okay i can't go around them most people do that they do the right thing it's when they're approaching the bus from the opposite side head on where they're uh, zipping by and by the way the fine in new hampshire for going by a school bus with flashing lights on is five hundred dollars that's pretty steep um Look out for kids because a lot of times they'll linger around, you know, they just, you know, want to talk to their friends out the window, uh, throw things, you know, to their friends or throw things back into the bus. Here's a picture of a Durham bus that I took with a student. Let's see if I can find that. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Terror. Mercy. Terror at a school bus stop in Tampa this morning. I didn't know which kid to help because there was so many laying on the ground. Witnesses say a speeding car slammed into five children and two adults, leaving one child in critical condition. The driver now in custody. One of four accidents at school bus stops in just the past three days. In central Pennsylvania this morning, a seven-year-old killed in a hit and run. The driver never even stopping to help. While in Mississippi, this man is now charged with aggravated assault after a nine-year-old was struck and killed. And in Indiana, a community is mourning three siblings killed this week crossing the road on their way to the bus. That driver also facing charges. Some 25 million students nationwide ride a school bus, but experts say getting on and off can be the most dangerous time, especially this time of year. Right before daylight saving time ends, it's often dark as children wait in the morning. So reflective clothing or backpacks can help and teach children to line up away from the street, stay alert, and never assume a driver will stop. A deadly lesson learned the hard way for so many this week. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out. I apologize, I couldn't find the Durham bus. So that was just a news clip that I had. I think that's the next slide. That's the next slide. And what they showed you, five people were killed in bus crashes. I think this was about a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, Those three children were from the same family. So the mother and dad lost all their kids in one car crash. And I believe the parents were home at the time. I can't think of anything that would be more traumatic than to hear a crash and then to come out and see what has happened. And I truly believe it was because people were speeding and they were distracted. This is preventable. Something like this should not happen. There's no excuse. And as sorry as people may be, and they could be good people that caused this crash, um, I think there should be consequences. Okay, and I'm not quite sure what, I should probably look that up, see if we can find out whether they've actually adjudicated this, this case. But I believe, oh, there's the picture of the Durham bus. So 25 feet is about uh, two car lengths. That I always try to give you things, like I said, with signals, 100 feet is about two car, um, two telephone poles. So try to remember if you could squeeze two cars in front of your vehicle with the flashing lights on, you probably have 25 feet. All right. So try to use things that will jog your memory of how to do it. And secondly, if you do have a, a test question, what the answer would actually be. Railroad crossings, you would think, 
would be pretty safe. You wouldn't think that there would be many crashes. Do trains cross roads? Absolutely. And a lot of times they go underneath. We have train trussles and things like that. But anytime that it, there's a railroad crossing intersecting a, a street, there's going to be a chance of a crash. Now, if there's a crash, it is probably the fault of the driver. You got to remember a train can only do two things. It can only go forward and it can go backwards. Now, once it's in motion, it could take close to a mile. When it's going full steam ahead, it could take up to a mile to stop a train. So cars are making the mistake where they're, they're trying to go around the gate. They're trying to speed up and get in front of a train before it comes, thinking they've got enough time. All mistakes. And they're usually fatal or they're pretty serious crashes. So what I want you to write down, um, look for signs. You're going to have a circle sign coming at you first. That will be railroad crossing warning. It's a yellow sign. And then you'll come to the sign that we have here on the slide. That's a cross buck sign. The other bit of information that's really important is that you have a double track. Now, why is it important that there are two tracks? Because if you're the first person at the railroad stop and the gate goes up, you better make sure that there's a train not going from the opposite direction. Because if you start going across as that first train goes by, you may get hit from the train coming from the opposite direction. And that has happened. Now, the gates are supposed to stay down until both trains have gone by. But remember, don't trust anything unless you can see because mechanical problems do happen. Now, the middle bullet where it says you must stop 15 feet before track, no more than 50, this is important, not so much the 50 feet. Um, I think 15 is more important to know. If you're stopping closer than 15 feet, there's always a chance that the train could derail. Uh, derailment means that the train tips over. So from the bottom of the train cart to the top is between 12 and 15 feet. So when you're closer than the 15 feet, it's going to crush you or crush your car. So stay back a distance. Now, I went to a conference, um, I guess it was a couple years ago, and we had someone from Massachusetts that was part of like a state trooper, um, you know, uh, division that dealt just with train crashes. He was kind of like the head of the Northeast region of Amtrak. And he gave us a video that I'm going to show you right now about some of the uh, problems with cars and what to hand, what to do if you ever get to a track and it's malfunctioning. You know, who do you call? How do you fix it? Uh, how do the rails go back up again? So I'm going to um, uh, show you the safety video that he gave us. Multiple injuries. 600,000 ton train that could be barreling down and hitting you. We hit a big truck. We're on the ground. It's a horrifying experience. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh! Hundreds of people are killed at crossings every year, and these are completely preventable. One of the ways we can prevent these accidents is for the public to do their job. The emergency notification system provides motorists or pedestrians with a phone number that they can call, and then we'll be able to stop train traffic that's heading in that direction. the first phone call you want to make if there's anything happening at a crossing. You want to stop any oncoming train. 
Every grade crossing is protected with an emergency notification sign. What that provides is an emergency notification phone number that the passenger or the motorist can immediately notify the railroad of any emergency at that crossing. The locator crossing number, which is six digits and a letter, can effectively tell the train dispatcher exactly where they are. When you call that number, you're talking to the train dispatcher that's specifically associated with that railroad. You'll get a response right away. The train dispatcher picks up and he's going to ask, what location are you at? You give him that DOT number, just stay clear of the tracks. Let the dispatcher handle everything from that point on. Once you get that call in, for me to contact my, the locomotive engineer on the train, it could be five, ten seconds. I'm going to get him on the radio immediately and say, bring your train to a safe stop. This, we have an emergency situation ahead. Call 911 is not going to stop the train from coming. The first responder is your train dispatcher in this case. That 800 number is going to get you right to the first responder. Unfortunately, far too often people get complacent around railroad tracks. That's really a recipe for harm or, or disaster. If you're towing a vehicle, um, if you're a fire engine responding to an emergency situation, you still need to let the railroad know that you're in that space, that you are close to the tracks or you're on the tracks. The ENS sign can be located in many places, either on the cross buck, directly at the crossing, or on the silver box, which is usually located adjacent to the crossing. So you should call it if you suspect that the gates are malfunctioning, if you see a vehicle that's stuck on the tracks, if you see any suspicious activity, if you see something that looks out of place, or an object that's obstructing the tracks. As soon as your vehicle is stuck on the tracks and the crossing is activated, you need to get away from that vehicle as soon as possible and run at a 45 degree angle towards the train. Far too many times we see people trying to save their vehicles. And the unfortunate reality is when they're trying to save their vehicles, in many cases they lose their life. These incidents also have a profound impact on locomotive engineers. Because that individual it may have long-term effects from this incident that affect them professionally and personally. It's not, it's not gonna stop. If something happens and you are stuck on the grade crossing, the first thing you want to do is get your car off. So just drive through the gate. The gates are meant to break away, and so you will be able to get to the other side. You never want to be stuck at a crossing. So don't try to get over the crossing until you know you can get to the other side. Don't be stuck in traffic and sitting on a grade crossing, on a railroad crossing, in the path of a train. It's a horrifying experience. We've had careers that have been ended as a result of these incidents. Every one of these accidents breaks our heart, and we need to do everything we possibly can to keep people off those crossings and away from trains. A lot of folks look at active grade crossings where you have gates and arms as an inconvenience and an annoyance. Those arms are not there to prevent you from being where you want to be, but to help you get there safely.
I thought that was uh, pretty interesting, especially going off at an angle, because you just never realize when debris, you know, is going to fly, how far it's going to go. Um, and, and when you really think about it, getting hit by a train just probably never crosses your mind. But now that you're driving and you're going to be going over railroad tracks, it, things will start to happen. I mean, you know, who would think that a limousine would be stuck on a, on a train track? But as you can see, it did. It does happen. Here's a case in point where a driver dies with a, a, a train, and this is in Massachusetts. But notice her age. She's 91. She was trying to get around the gates. You don't want to do that. You don't want to drive around. You want to wait for the gates to go up when they're supposed to. And apparently the gates were, were, they were working correctly. She was just confused or impatient. Um, so these things do happen. And also be careful when you're in traffic because the mistakes of other people may in, you know, come in conflict with you. So their debris or being hit will actually fly to your vehicle or go, their car will get pushed to your car. Here is probably, I think, the most complicated thing to understand and to do well uh, when it comes to signs, signals, and payment markings right away is so confusing to people. So let's start from the, the ground up, okay? Let's build upon right of way. Uh, right of way is basically uh, who should wait, okay? It says the, the law doesn't give anyone the right of way. It only says who must yield it. I like, I like replacing the word yield with the word wait. So if you do that last sentence, it makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? only who must wait, all right? So generally at an intersection with no traffic control, like a sign or a signal, the vehicle on the right has the right of way, meaning they don't have to wait, they get to go. Now, what happens when we start having situations where a cars come at the same time, they're going in different directions. So there are some exceptions that we're going to go through right now. So I want you to write these down or be familiar with these. The first one, a vehicle in the intersection, so that means you've already crossed into the middle area, has the right of way, has the ability to go before a car that is preparing to get into that intersection. Notice it has nothing to do with, with stop signs. It has to do with just coming to an area. A vehicle going straight has the right of way over a vehicle turning left. We see that at traffic lights. It'll show you a, a symbol of a green ball, and it says, you know, you must yield on a left-hand turn at the intersection here. Now, emergency vehicles that are responding to an alarm. So anytime you see the sirens, hear the um sirens or see the lights, I should say, then they get to go first through the roadway, through the intersection. Pedestrians have the right of way. If you're on a main road over a side road, you have the right of way. Blind people have the right of way and people getting to the intersection and stopping first, regardless of where their location is at the intersection. Now, since we've talked about this just briefly, let's just get this out of the way. Even if you know that you should be going first, the other person should be waiting, and they don't wait, give it up. Just let them go. Okay? Being in a college town, you're going to see a lot of people not following this rule. So if everybody knows the rules and follows the rules, driving is somewhat simple. It gets complicated when we know the rules and they do not, and we try to act upon what we should be doing, and then someone takes it away from us. So then you're going to have to just, you know, bring it back down, stop again, let them go, and then make sure that we can get back out into the intersection and now go through, even though we lost the right of way. Oh, the other one that um, isn't mentioned here is funerals. Anybody going to a cemetery? 
they'll have a, a purple flag on their car. You can write that down. A purple flag on a vehicle is an indicator of a fuel uh, procession. They can run stop signs, traffic lights. There could be like 40, 50 cars all going to the gravesite. They all get to run the stop sign and go through the, uh, the red light. They can go as a group. They don't have to stop. Legally, they can do that. So just be aware of that. Now, with emergency vehicles, and I can't find this video. I liked it too. Emergency vehicles pull over to the side of the road with your signal and stop. Wait for them to go by. Use your signal. Check your mirrors. Look over your shoulder. And then go back into the flow of traffic. Now, when we talk about emergency vehicles, we're talking about police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances. Tow trucks, public service, mail trucks, they are not emergency vehicles. They do not have the right of way over you. Just police, fire, ambulance. Those three, those are the only ones. Anybody else with flashing lights on? Nope, sorry. That's just telling you you're behind me or you're in front of me, but they get no special treatment, okay? Um, this used to be in the old manual, and I kept it in because they were talking about people in the front seat. You shouldn't have um, more people in the front seat than you have seat belts. Um, and the other thing, too, is don't let anybody sit on the, the, the hood, the roof, or the trunk of a vehicle because they could slide off. This was kind of like that, a case in point where a brother and sister were fooling around in a parking lot and um, the sister ran over a brother. Uh, don't fool around in your car. I would guarantee. Now, this is a good, we haven't had a question in a while. I've taught um, tonight for a bit without asking a question. So if you're on YouTube or actually on your, uh, on your phone, text me the answer to this question. Have you ever sat on the trunk, roof, or hood of a vehicle that was moving. I don't care if it was a parking lot. I don't care if it was a side road or a main road, but you were on a vehicle that was moving and you were not inside. You were on the outside of it, okay? Text it to me and I wanna see how many people. I'm gonna guess, let me see how many people are still watching. Okay, we got 12 people. I'm gonna bet there's at least five of you that have been on a moving vehicle, all right? Uh, and while I wait for these text messages to come in, let me take a look at um, this snapshot of some UNH students. Watch this. Look at that. What's wrong with this picture? Well, they're not sitting. They're not sitting down. They're all standing up. And the other thing from the picture to the right, are they on the correct side of the road? Why are they driving on the wrong side of the road? So if they stop real quick or make a turn real quick, at least some of them, at least some of them are going to fall out of that truck. Now, legally, if they're older than 18, they don't have to be in a seatbelt. Oh, some of you are saying no. Let's see how, what I got here. I'm going to. Ah. Ah. I kind of figured, I see one saying yes. I got a few people. A few people said that they have. Not as much as I thought. I thought I, w I would have thought I would have had a higher number. Now, I take this with a grain of salt because this was told to me by a student. We were driving and we were having this lesson. He told me he had a friend that actually put metal plates on the bottom of his feet. And he would open up the door, the back door, and he would actually um, drop his feet onto the pavement and kind of like surf on those metal plates and sparks would come off and they would be going around 30 miles per hour down the road kind of like on a skateboard holding on to a car. It's amazing some of the foolishness that people do. Um, so uh, don't get caught up in the fun and games that people uh, try to, you know, convince you is a good time. Stay inside the vehicle. So don't let anybody sit on the hood, roof, trunk of a vehicle. Uh, don't be in the back of a pickup as we just saw. 
If you have anything that sticks out the side of the car, make sure it's on the right side, not on the left. If it's on the right side, it shouldn't be any more than six inches. Um, this should not be more than three people in the front because it's going to prevent you from operating the controls. House trailer or utility trailer, what they're talking about is towing on the back of a pickup, like what you would do to a um, to the dump. And a house trailer, it's not a Winnebago, but it's one of those, you know, campers that you tow. You shouldn't be in the inside. It should be inside the truck. Um, the, probably the most important part of this slide is the tethering of animals. Now, dogs must be tethered. What that means, tethered means to be tied from both sides, all right? Tethered means tied to the left, tied to the right, and that you get to move ever so slightly in either direction. What was happening is that dogs would come, uh, the owner of a pickup would come to a stop sign, stop. He'd have his dog in the back, only with a leash, tied only on one leash, and the dog would jump out after somebody. And a lot of times the dog would be dragged because the owner didn't realize that he jumped out just as he pulled away. Uh, so that's dangerous. So being tied on both sides so the dog can't jump out on either side. That's what they're talking about here. Um, so that's on signs and pavements. Uh, that gets us through just about everything that we want to. We're just going to spend a, a little bit time on stopping. It's a very short section in the manual, uh, but I did want to go over that. Um, so let's talk about stopping. And the thing that I want you to write down about stopping is that stopping begins with what you can see. If you don't see well or you don't see a need to stop, you won't stop. So the most important thing is to use your eyes effectively like what we talked about. And when it comes to stopping... There's only so much that you can do. So the first part of the equation in stopping is you, your eyes and your reflexes and how quick you can get from the gas to the brake. Um, by the way, um, now that most of you have driven with me, there's a few that haven't, but I do have a brake on my side of the vehicle. So let me give you a situation. We'll, we'll go back towards the yellow light situation. We're driving towards a green light and the light turns yellow. How much do you want to bet that I can get to my brake before you can get to your brake? I bet you I can brake earlier than you can. Even though I'm older than you and your reflexes are so much better than mine, I can still beat you getting from the gas pedal to the brake. Even though my foot is away from the brake pedal, it's not on the brake. It's off to the side, just like your foot is on the, on the gas pedal. I still, the reason being is I look better of things that are happening and I anticipate better. So that is the, the key to stopping, is looking and anticipating. The actual using of the brake, once you start to use it, everybody's the same. All right? So a, a person that breaks badly is really a person that doesn't look correctly or um, doesn't anticipate, all right? Let me show you, time does matter. Watch this. Just five miles per hour over the 30 miles per hour speed limit. How much further will it take to stop? One foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, 10 feet, 11 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet, 14 feet, 15 feet, 16 feet, 17 feet, 
18 feet, 19 feet, 20 feet. Feet. Can't you see that he wishes he had some extra time and distance? I mean, you, once the brakes start to be activated, you're basically stuck. Um, so let's let's take a look at um, this. Is something that's kind of cool too. Is I found an Australian commercial talking about stopping distance, and I want you to write this down in your notes. Uh, if you go slower, like we said with that yellow light we talked about tonight, by going slower, you have more options. It's easier to make a decision, yes or no, to go through a yellow light. If you're going slower, watch this on the highway. If you drop your speed by five miles per hour, the difference that it makes in stopping distance is unbelievable. So this was an Australian um, commercial. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one travelling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead, and both drivers first react, and then, a moment later, they brake. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five metres of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at five k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, five k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? It's unbelievable when you take a look at it that way, how things can be minimized just by going a little bit slower. I think we have to have that mentality. Most of us like to go fast, and tomorrow we're going to talk about speed. But really, when you start thinking about being in a bad situation, going slower, more time, more space is going to make you a better driver. So even when road and vehicle conditions are ideal, so we're talking about perfect driving conditions, and you're perfectly alert. So we got the best driving conditions and you're at your best. It takes a great distance to stop a motor vehicle. So through the use of good judgment and the knowledge of stopping distance, you can reduce the chance of being involved in a crash. Now, early tonight, I told you I was gonna test you on basically what your knowledge of stopping distance is. So this is what I want you to do right now. Um, you got to text me the answer. From the time that you see something, just like we saw on that last video on the highway, from the time that you see something to the time that you come to a complete stop at 20 miles per hour is how many feet? So text me the answer. How many feet will it take to stop 20 miles per hour? And what's the speed limit by school? Sometimes it's 20. So text me the answer on the phone, and I'm going to take a look and see what we got. Got a couple people texting in.
Okay, I almost got enough here. Well, take a guess. I'm only looking feet. Okay, I'm going to read you some of the uh, answers that I've got. Um, two people are pretty much right spot on. I've got 50 feet. Um, someone said seconds. I wanted I wanted feet. 100 feet. Um, yeah, I want feet. I don't know why people are having a hard time. 40, 20, 25, 5. That's interesting. 100, 50. Actually, 50 is the closest. It's really right around 47 feet. So roughly 50 feet from the time that you see something to the time you stop at 20 miles per hour is going to take you roughly about 50 feet. 50 feet isn't really that big of a distance when you if you were to go outside take a look at 50 feet that's basically um like four car lengths if you line them up bumper to bumper and that's a 20 miles per hour now let's double our speed to 40 miles per hour so you think if it's 50 to stop at 20 then it must be about 100 feet if you're going 40 miles per hour it's not it's always going to be more. So if you're going 40 miles per hour, stopping distance isn't 100, it's 149. Stopping distance at 60 miles per hour, which is a highway speed, is 366 feet. If you're on a highway from the time you see something to the time that you come to a stop, you're going the length of a football field. Now, Stopping is really physics. It's really, you know, it's a science. The thing that I want you to understand is that for every 10 miles per hour that you drive, one second, okay, uh, not one second, for every 10 miles you go, you go 11 feet. That, that's what it is, all right? So for every... 10 miles. So if you go 40 miles per hour from the time you go from the gas to the brake, so just reacting, you're going 44 feet. That's pretty crazy. If you're going 60 miles per hour, you're going 66 feet just getting your foot off the gas to go to the brake. You've got to understand the faster you go, the longer it's going to take to stop. This is why people are having problems, why they rear end cars. This is why there's a problem in bad weather, because we think we can stop like we normally do, and we're going much, much further. We have to have a good concept of, of stopping distance. So three things are happening to stop your vehicle. The first one, you must see and recognize the danger to stop. We had a whole um, little portion of one of our classes last week on inattention blindness. There are traffic light stop signs that for whatever reason, we're just not picking up. So if you don't see something, how do you know that there's a need to stop? Your brain must tell your foot to step on the brake pedal. And lastly, your foot must operate the brake pedals correctly. So it has to be in that order. That's how you stop a vehicle, seeing it, reacting to it, and then having the foot use the brake pedal at the right amount of pressure. That way you're not going to hit something. Now with some of you this past week, I took you to a parking lot and I had you feel what ABS felt like when it kicks in. So ABS is going to help you um, be more efficient in your brake pressure. It doesn't necessarily, and this is going to be a question on your uh, homework tonight. I'm going to give you um, a chapter. I forgot what chapter it is, um, but it doesn't allow you to, to stop really much quicker, but it does allow you to stop a little bit more effectively. Um, there are some definitions here that I want you to write down, and this is from the manual. Uh, you will be tested. I don't know if it's the final or the midterm, but a human reaction is the time it takes from the moment you see a danger until you step on the brake. So that's called reaction time. The distance your vehicle has traveled during that um, 
portion is called reaction distance. Um, average, the average driver takes about three quarters of a second. So what would make you not react? Could be fatigue. It could be distracted with your cell phone. It could be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Uh, reaction could be because of glare. You just don't see the image clearly. So you're reacting a little bit slow because you weren't quite sure what it was. And then you realized it was a pedestrian. Then the last part of braking is a vehicle. So the first part of the equation is you, what you're able to do with your quickness, your alertness. The last part is up to your vehicle. So we're talking about the weight of your vehicle, um, suspension, your tires. Tires, by the way, and we're going to see a video on this in just a moment. One of the most important things with stopping is the rubber gripping the roadway. Because remember, that is basically... Uh, part of the equation is brakes and tires. It's just not brakes, it's tires. Because your your brakes are, are slowing the tire down, but you have to have the right uh, uh, tire pressure and the right um, tire tread to deal with the surface to stop a vehicle. So braking time is the time it takes for the brakes and the friction between the road and the tires to stop a vehicle. And then braking distance is the distance that your vehicle travels during that period. So when I was asking you the question at 20 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour, we were taking in those two components. And in the old manual, and it's not in the new manual, I don't know why they took it out, they actually gave you a graph. So you could actually see exponentially how, how stopping distance goes up with speed. And we'll talk more about speed tomorrow. Um, the last thing, like I told you, was tires. So let me show you the clip on, on tires. Oh, other things to write down, write this down. What else can affect a stopping distance? Of course, the road surface. So we've got, you know, slow uh, snow. S snow and ice on the roadway right now in the winter. So it's going to take longer to stop. We talked about uh, brake pedals and or brake pads and tires, um, weather, and we mentioned fatigue, alcohol and drugs, distractions inside the vehicle, all those things. They all are components. They all work against you, okay? Work against you for stopping your car. So let's take a look at, I think it's Toyota that put this uh, video together for tires. We tested the effect worn tires have on stopping distance. 60 miles per hour on a wet road. Three sets of tires, each with different tread depths. And one professional driver. When the driver accelerated to 60 miles per hour, watch what happened when he tried to stop. While your actual distances may vary, it took him nearly 10 additional car lengths to stop on worn tires. So, when will you stop? Ask about our complimentary tire inspections. So you can see tires make a huge, huge difference. If you ever watch NASCAR, that have you noticed their tires? They have no tread. There's more rubber gripping the road on a ball tire. So in a perfectly beautiful day on good pavement, you want a ball tire. But the reason why we have tread uh, is because like this morning, there's like snow on the ground. We need something where the snow can go into the grooves and, and push through the slush. We need something that channels out what we're going over, whether it be slush, water, snow. So bad weather is the only reason why we have have tread on our tires. So what I want you to do, I'm going to go on to uh, Facebook and put questions for signs, signals, and payment markings. And remember, I want you to use your, your notes and anything that will help you to do that. 
Uh, we are going to talk about road rage and speed for tomorrow, um, as well as distract. Well, distracted driving. We'll put to the end. Uh, we may get to parking. We may get to parking, and then um, the driving emergencies and midterm will be for uh, Wednesday. Let me get out of here for a second. Um, I haven't had a chance to go through uh, who can drive, so I want to do this one last time. Let me put this up. I do have um, a, a new time for tomorrow. Um, it looks like I have um, 12 o'clock. Someone wants, Matt doesn't want to drive. Matt, if there's another time that you could drive besides that, that would be helpful. But is there anybody that can drive tomorrow at 3 or 4? And if you could do it on YouTube, that way I can see it a little bit easier because I really don't want to at least build out tomorrow's time. Uh, Wednesday, um, I haven't had any takers except Sarah said that she would uh, drive on Wednesday sometime. So apparently, Sarah, you're the only one right now. But I need some of you to start signing up. So tomorrow, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, um, I need drivers and if someone could take Matt's time at 12, that would be helpful too, if there's any takers. Or 1 o'clock, I guess. 1 o'clock I would do um, if no one takes if no one takes a noon time. If you live close by the school, I'd come get you. Um, that's not a problem. Um, if you can't get a ride, because I need to drive with you. I do. Because I don't know what the weather's going to be like for next week. Um, it could be horrible. And if that's the case, uh, we're screwed if we lose three days during vacation. So I'm going to, I want to wait and see if I can get a couple takers. And make sure you do your reading in the state manual. Um, it's easy to overlook that because it is kind of simple to do. Um, and like I said, it's only like a paragraph or two. Um, so parking, which we're going to be going over. Um, got some videos for you for that. Um, that's on page 25 of the manual. So make sure you read that for tomorrow too. We'll try to get into that. Okay, I'm getting some. All right, so Kathy, I'll give you three tomorrow. So Kathy's got three tomorrow. Do I have someone for four? Four o'clock for tomorrow? Curtis, um, I'll give you, um, if you want early, let's do 8 o'clock. Curtis, you can take 8 o'clock on, on Wednesday. Uh, Kyle, I'll give you 4 o'clock tomorrow. So Kyle took 4. Is there anybody that wants like 1 o'clock? Does anybody want 1 o'clock? All right, Matt, we're going to have to not drive at all tomorrow, so I'm going to take you out. So nobody else for um, 1 o'clock tomorrow? Do I have a taker before we end today? And, Curtis, I'll give you Wednesday. So, Kyle, you've got tomorrow at 4. So Kathy's at 3, Kyle's at 4. Anybody for one? I'm looking for a one o'clock. It's so hard because there's a delay.
All right, I'll let you guys go for tonight. Um, I'll go on Facebook, uh, post um, the um, questions for you. But please text me if uh, Wednesday does uh, turn out to be something that you can do because um, we gotta we got to drive. All right, but that's it for um, content for tonight. So um, remember to get your work, tie. I'll send it to you as soon as I get the, um, the link ready. All right, have a good night.